hello, I am Colette Robbins, and this is Sophie Kahn right below me here. And we are both the hosts of File Exchange, and we are both digital analog artists who during the pandemic discovered uh, a bit of a void in the discourse about artists using 3D software. So we created this channel File Exchange, and File Exchange is a place for artists to connect and share ideas, tools, and tips revolving around what it's like to use these 21st century tools uh, in art. You get to be a fly on the wall for these hour long conversations. So welcome. And today our guest is Jonathan Monahan. And both Sophie and I have known Jonathan for quite a while. I have known Jonathan since 2012 or around there um, when we both did the uh, first hackathon at the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, with MakerBot, where we got to uh, 3D scan antiquities on site and then 3D print them. And, uh, and I just remember how impressed I was with his you know, knowledge of the software at that point. I mean, there weren't a lot of artists out there using that software. So, um, and Sophie, you also know Jonathan and you're gonna um, pass oh, that yeah. along to you. Yeah, yeah, I've known Jonathan probably the same time, like a decade. Around, um, okay. We've been in the same circles. Um, Jonathan and I first met in 2011 when we 3D scanned Stephen Colbert. Um, on his own show, and I'm just going to share a 16 second clip of that, a little blast from the past here. I came here with a lasers and <laughs> put cornstarch on my head and then scanned my head to get a three dimensional rendering of my face. And now it's making it. There we go. So, um, yeah, more than a decade. Amazing. <laughs> um, but I've always been a huge fan of Jonathan's work. I've always been really impressed by his commitment to his craft, like the really almost obsessive and fanatical but gorgeous detail and intricacy of his models. Um, and I think he combines that real commitment um, with a keen eye for contemporary aesthetics, a kind of subtly sardonic take on contemporary visuals, on branding and advertising. Um, and I just think that his work is really stunning. I curated him a while ago into a show called Dream Space where I invited artists to 3D model dreams, uh, spaces of their dreams, and his space was a highlight too. So we'll share that link in the comments. Um, so yeah, welcome, Jonathan. We're really happy to be speaking with you today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, so yeah, so I'm an artist and I work with uh, computer animation. I also create prints and sculpture. Um, and right here, you're looking at uh, an installation shot from a uh, recent art uh, solo exhibition. Um, and I say recent because uh, it wasn't, it was actually in March of 2020 that I put together uh, this uh, solo exhibition. It was at this uh, gallery in Russia. It was actually like the largest solo exhibition in my career. And um, it took place um, sort of right in the middle of the pandemic and uh, right when the pandemic was starting. And I almost, um, I almost got stuck over there in Russia because that's when all the uh, lockdowns were going into effect and the kind of the borders were closing and all of this. Um, but anyways, uh, I was there, we installed this exhibition and um, I got home okay. But uh, so what you're looking at is like a series of um, sort of, I call them like wall decals. There are these like large adhesive prints on uh, the surface of the wall and uh, all of my work whether it's like prints or sculpture or computer animation all comes from the same virtual 3d space so i use the same uh software to create you know a variety of different uh artworks you know um and so you can see some of the details on this work uh in these types of pieces Incredible. i'm very yeah i'm very interested i think in the use like sort of I use technology in my practice as we all do but I try and turn a critical eye towards it um and, and often at times in these pieces I create the technology takes on like sort of an ominous feel or sort of like a scary uh kind of alien like feel mm -hmm. to it and um the exhibition is called the trace left by the future and I sort of think about these works as like artifacts from this uncertain future or sort of artifacts from this alt alternate reality uh, and so they, you know, they're sort of ambiguous in what they are, what they're supposed to be, but they're a little intimidating, but at the same time, they're also like a little, 
like seductive and colorful and they have these pop colors to them. So a lot of these sort of dualities where we look at technology as something that's uh, ominous and scary, but also sort of seductive and mm -hmm. at the same time. I have a question just yeah. right out of the gate as we're on this particular image, um, because I think what is so compelling as, as Sophie pointed out about your work and what I'm, I've always been drawn to is just the level of detail with and mastery over this uh, over the software that you're using, which we know is really, really time consuming to learn that even if you have a background in it, um, because you always have to update um, and learn more and, you know, um, what software are you using and um, you know, how do you, yeah, like, how do you go about composing and like, where do the, yeah, where do the ideas for the different textures come from? So these are created using a software called 3D Studio Max. And, oh, okay. and I've been using this software uh, since I was in high school, since I was like uh, 15 years old or something. And uh, I began teaching myself the software um, back in high school, I, I didn't have any like friends, I didn't have any activities or hobbies or anything else in high school. I was just, uh, I just played some video games and then I was just like, oh, I could use this software to make video games. And so I started making my own sort of video games and elements for video games back when I was like 13, 14, 15. And then that led me to uh, 3D Studio Max. And I began, you know, creating images and renderings and animations just for fun and teaching myself uh, this software. And yeah, I just got really into it. And actually this image, one of the images I created when I was 16 years old, when I created it, it actually got somehow published in a textbook on how to use uh, that software. It was called the 3D Studio Max 7 Bible. And, uh, really? I remember yeah, so it was just like this. Out of books. <laughs> yeah, yes, it was back when you had to learn software out of books yeah. and stuff. Yeah. yeah, and it was, it was um, I think published in, so the yeah, it was published must have been published in like 2002 or something like that or 2000 yeah it was a while ago and uh so anyways so it was like i got really interested in uh, and one of the things i was always doing back then too was trying to create something that was photorealistic or trying to create uh -huh. something that was believable as like a photo and that was what drew me to the software i think to begin with was the idea that it gives you this opportunity to create something that you don't need like uh, a set or like a camera or like actors or anything like that. You can just create this imagery uh, or these narratives without you know, needing all this sort of capital in a way to create yeah. it. You know, you could just anything you could imagine uh, you could create uh, using the software. And so I was always very interested in specifically like the lighting and materials and textures and all of these things that uh, help determine that sort of realism or that hyper realism or the photorealistic uh, aspect to you know creating images with 3D software. And so obviously you see that in all my work here as well. But did you study traditional um, linear perspective drawing, painting, like because you not, just seem to have such a, a handle on on that as well, which is yeah. unusual. You know, it's not always present if you start with software and then learn, you know, like, so you learned it later. Yeah, I learned all the art stuff later. I, you know, because I had all of this, uh, you know, I was just being this like, you know, again, this computer geek and just making, uh, you know, just very casually just making pieces. I mean, I was very into it, uh, but there was no reason why I was making the images I was making uh, mm -hmm. other than just to try and explore the software and try and create something that was interesting. Um, and so I was always very interested in architecture too. So a lot of my earlier pieces were very like architectural. And, um, but anyways, I began to learn art because I had to go to college and I decided to get a BFA in computer graphics. And a lot of the programs uh, were, you know, art centered. So we had to take drawing and painting courses and art history courses. And I wasn't, I didn't even really know much about art. I didn't I wasn't even really prepared for that. Um, it just sort of uh, became the next step, I think, to develop this career and develop this um, develop this work. And so, but then I got really into that as well. I became really absorbed in the history of modern art and contemporary art, learned a lot about contemporary artists. Um, it sort of became 
uh, an assistant to a number of sculptors, uh, actually, as well. This is how I got involved in like digital fabrication and 3D Good printing. Education, yeah. Yeah. So when I was in, uh, and this is like maybe another example too of integrating some sculptural aspects into my practice. Uh, this is a sculptural video work uh, with 3D printed elements. And the frame, right? We're looking at the frame. Yeah. So it's like a yeah. laser, laser cut frame. Yeah. Beautiful. And, uh, some like gold, 3D printed gold elements that yeah, uh, interlock into the frame. So I guess I had a bit of a sculptural sensibility education from also working as an assistant to a number of sculptors. I worked uh, Ken Snelson, who was um, a sculptor in Soho, because I went to BFA in New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did like an assistant to a lot of different sculptors. And I think I got uh, also an education in the more traditional, quote unquote, traditional fine arts that way. So yeah, so that's sort of, um, it's sort of where I'm coming from in terms of my background, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going through some different works here and I can take a look at the software too in, in a moment. Um, but I'll, let me show this and we'll take a look at uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah. maybe some, product, some background yeah. stuff. Background. So I began this series of work. Um, a lot of my pieces are influenced also by historical artworks. Uh, so I mentioned becoming really interested in, you know, those art history classes I took uh, back in college. And um, also you mentioned earlier, like how we did that project at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so museums and historical artworks have always been a major source of inspiration. Uh, for my work and, and I do a lot of research and this becomes a sort of, I oftentimes sort of retell the narratives and symbols that we see in these traditional artworks in a contemporary, through a contemporary lens. And this is one example here. So this is like a, a printed work and it has some 3D printed elements on it. It's a print on aluminum. And the imagery is all created using, of course, um, computer animated 3D, uh, 3D Studio Max, the you know, computer animation software. And um, so you can, uh, this piece comes from like this historical engraving by Albert Durr. Um, and this is like a symbol of justice. You know, we have our modern day symbol of justice that we see of the, this blind woman with the two scales. And this is one of those ancient symbols, except in Albert Durr's version here, it's like this all seeing eye, which is really interesting. Like these eyes were kind of like, you know, I just thought these were really weird and interesting. They're kind of seeing everything. And so uh, in the piece we have, these 3D printed windows that are, uh, and then there's like LED lights behind it here. And so these eyes are like sort of these really kind of like ominous all seeing things. And uh, this uh, figure is like, it's like this robotic figure. It's not quite like a human, it's not quite robotic. It's like this strange alien form. And this figure is like masked, but if you notice this was like from 2019 before gonna... mask became, <laughs> yeah. yeah, before mask became ubiquitous. Yeah. And this piece, I think, uh, at the time, what I was a little bit interested in was at the time, there was a lot of these like um, uh, pro-democracy uh, protests in Hong Kong, um, mm -hmm. these sort of pro-free speech, uh, anti-government uh, protests in Hong Kong that were going on at the time uh, when I was creating this work. And I became very interested in how those protesters were sort of uh, um, what they were wearing. They were wearing like, you know, masks to protect themselves from you know, the surveillance and also mm -hmm. uh, the tear gas. And then they had like yeah. they were headphones. They're all sort of like geared out in all of this technology, yeah. uh, which I thought was really interesting. And so this was a bit of like, I guess, an homage in a way to uh, to them, you know, being this uh, justice, you know, this righteousness um, mm. uh, symbol, symbol of righteousness and justice. Um, so anyways, that's where this piece sort of came from. Mm -hmm. And um, so I continuing on with these sort of creatures and figures that are sort of masked and they're sort of consumed by technology, like the technology is sort of overtaking them in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it also reminds me of, do you know the um, uh, artist Zanti Jawinski? No, I don't think so. I will. Yeah, yeah, I'll send you a link as well, or I'll I'll show because I think I think you would really like his. He actually did work as like a set designer too, mm -hmm. but he did a number of amazing like heads. Here, I will do a screen share. Um, and so he did like. I'm gonna stop your share for one second. Yeah. Um, this is Zanti uh, Shawinsky. He's oh, incredible. He was a really early futurist. Yeah, yeah. And he 
but he did a number of like these kind of pieces, like where he like was putting together, um, like creating heads out of components oh, and kind of reanimating them, um, which really, and yeah, yeah he did like- too, and like the military. Yeah. That's so, these are so interesting. These are great. They're, they're, he's one of my favorite artists um, in terms of, I just think there's something, Fantastic. you know, kind of futurist and surrealistic about that, that reminded me of what you're doing, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's what's really interesting too, because I don't, in all my pieces and in my animations too, which we're not looking at right now, but in my animations, I, I don't always have, I don't use like figures or whatever in my, in those uh, pieces. I use like, um, uh, I use like, I guess, I use mythical animals and these other like references that are supposed to like be stand-ins for what I got some for the, mm -hmm. uh, for humans, but, uh, but I don't use like the figure in the work uh, as a, you know, for that, yeah. for that reason, because it's like, a, I think it's a way to, reference, yeah. yeah, I think it's just, there's a lot of connotations that you can bring in with that. And I want to, I think by using sort of these animals or these sort of robotic figures, I'm sort of, I think, telling my story in a little bit better way there. Mm, right. Almost like the figures from kind of heraldry too, you know, like the lion. Yeah. Yeah. And if we can go back to that image um, of the yeah. figure with the gold, like. The, yeah. Yeah, let me bring it up on go. The thing about that maybe. too is it's like, it's so redolent of the language of, um, you know, advertising and production. Mm -hmm. And it's just so the pink and the gold and these like velvet surfaces is so seductive. It's like, I look at that and I just think like, I want to buy those objects. <laughs> like you really yeah, I want to wear those glasses. I, like you've been conditioned on this almost visceral level. And, you know, we think about the Apple advertising, obviously, and all of these objects, but like these gorgeous surfaces. I mean, this weird, you know, perfume, vape, whatever this, these items are, you know, there's like, I'm like, I want to get my credit card out and buy these. Because <laughs> yeah, they're I that visceral thing that advertising does to you you know what which like makes a product shiny and desirable yeah. um yeah, yeah yeah that's what i think the software that i use or we use is really designed for you know it's it's mm -hmm. sort of really built for advertising and entertainment yeah. and so i haven't but i haven't and some artists you know do a really great job of sort of breaking that and and trying to create things you know uh, out and use the software and get away from that sort of inherent aesthetic that's mm -hmm. present in the software. Um, but my strategy is to jump into it and yeah, to lean into it. it. And yeah, to you can go either way. You can either really fight it and really disrupt it. Or, you know, another tactic as an artist is to amplify it to absurdity to make that visible, you know, to take it to the nth degree. I think it's the middle ground is usually less interesting, but these extremes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the things that you see in my practice, one of the themes is a lot of oftentimes too, the tension between like our consumer culture and our desire to, you know, to buy things and for plastic and for all of these like artificial man-made, you know, uh, things. And also the power too that corporations have over us and over our society. So these are some of the themes that you'll see throughout my practice. And so by using those very slick and seductive aesthetics, there's a dialogue there. But what I also like about it is that it gives people like an entrance point into the work. There's a degree of familiarity, especially like if you go to like some of my animations, for instance, you know, um, my video installations, there's, um, you know, these look like they could be a commercial, like a car commercial or like, uh, like a video game or, or other popular forms of entertainment. And, but then when you start to watch them and you start to like get into them, there's, they're a lot more confusing yeah. and they're a lot more harder to understand and they're a lot more challenging. And I think that's really interesting because, you know, there's like this entry point, uh, but then there's a different experience. There's a different, um, it's, it's, you know, the, the, there's a different, you know, when entertainment and all of these things, it's very easy. It's very like, you know, it's, it's crafted very well and it's very reinforcing about like our, ideas about what reality is and what society should be oftentimes with entertainment mm -hmm. and so uh, instead in, in these pieces you're getting something that's just like very confusing and hard to understand and yeah. I think that's a very interesting process right. it's like flipping it on its head it's like playing around yeah. with your 
yeah, taking you in your comfort zone and then somehow bringing you to another realm. Mm -hmm. I also think the, you know, adhesive pieces that you were showing remind me if like with the palette of Will Cotton, the painter, where to marry the kind of really intense um, kind of compositional structures of Lee Bontecu. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, Do you like yeah. That? Thank you. I love Lee Bontecu. So okay. Yeah. I love Lee Bontecu too. She's one of my all time favorites. And then yeah. I also love that you bring in like 1930s, like dancer, like head pieces as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me show you, uh, let me show I, you something what I'm working on now. This video, so, sorry, you were like killing me with this video, the one in Paris, because I remember that I yeah. saw that in Paris and I think we actually- This one, like, yeah. Yeah, and I think we hung out at the Palais de Tokyo and I'm just yeah, like, oh, yeah. oh my God, those were like, that was another life when I like went to Paris and did those. Wait, that yeah. was at the Palais de Tokyo? This it was, was amazing yeah, this was in that space. Wow, Jonathan, sorry, that's amazing. Like, really, like feeling sorry for myself that I can't go to Paris. So please carry on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, this this work, I'll just talk oh, briefly okay. about this work. Uh, this work was um, based off of this, these tapestries of the yeah. unicorn in the cloisters. Yeah. And this was a very interesting series of tapestries that showed like this, the hunt and the slaying and then this sort of resurrection of a mystical unicorn. And there are these medieval tapestries that were done you know, a very long time ago. And uh, they're beautiful pieces, beautiful tapestries, and they're so intricately produced. And so I did a lot of research on these tapestries, and I and they're very interesting. They're about often they're about like sort of this nature worship a lot. There's a lot of like you know specific um, botany that's present in these uh, tapestries that relate to like the passing of the seasons and a lot of like the pagan rituals and um, myths that surrounded the changing of the seasons and the harvest and all of this. Um, so. Uh, they're very interesting and sort of mysterious um, pieces of artwork. And so the piece that I created, Disco Beast, is my sort of version of these tapestries. It's sort of this unicorn that's uh, being hunted and slayed and then uh, resurrected and, and, and also captured as well in the piece you see here, the unicorn in captivity here. And so in, uh, maybe we could play a bit of a video. Yeah, definitely. And Amazing. so here in the animation, the unicorn is sort of, in the captivity of like a Starbucks and these very commercial spaces. Um, it looks so much better than an actual Starbucks bathroom. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing too. I think I create a lot of like corporate architecture in my video yeah. installations and I, you know, create them in the computer space. And I, I kind of go for like this platonic ideal of what like a Starbucks would be. And like, you know, there are like these, everything is placed perfectly and everything is like neat and organized mm. and, and super clean. Um, so here we see the unicorn coming back to life in a Starbucks bathroom mm -hmm. with a disco dance floor. <laughs> Yeah, I love how playful these are too. That they're just kind of and that is so much work to and you do it all yourself, right? You do yeah, all the I do it all myself. Yeah. This oh, was wow. a lot of work the Starbucks too. I and I had a I made the whole Starbucks from scratch too, because I couldn't um sometimes in computer graphics there were a lot of like, you know, stock I mean, assets and assets, stock things yeah. that you can draw from, uh, particularly with very banal ordinary components. Um, but I couldn't find one or I couldn't find one that I was happy with. So I had to do that whole Starbucks from scratch. It was a lot of work. Um, but, you know, it's building off too a lot of the um, software and techniques that, you know, architects would use to visualize yeah. new condos right. or new developments and things yeah. like that, uh, which I'm also very interested in as well. And again, sort of riffing on some of those aesthetics and uh, some of also those aesthetics are oftentimes very dehumanizing too, in a way, you know, and, and you were seeing advertisements for new condos or luxury furniture. And there's just, there's like the human presence isn't there. Like it's usually just like these very slick and seductive spaces and materials and textures. Yeah. So I'm trying to draw from that. In and that house. actually, I mean, like that was my first kind of entree into 3D was seeing those advertisements. And at the same time I had done my undergrad in photography and I was just sick to death of 
you know, that aesthetic came from photography. It was like a Dusseldorf school kind of thing. It was Andreas Gursky. It was mm -hmm. everyone in photography history was obsessed with the depopulated space, you know, these God's eye views. And I hated it. And that was completely like antithetical to the photography that I loved. That was the street level, the 35 millimeter, the like Diane Arbus, you know, right. all of that with humans. And so I think too, I, it's almost like we had a similar entry point into these tools and like this real visceral reaction against the overarching aesthetic that these tools presented. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, re <clears throat> that's really interesting to hear. And yeah. I think it was also, what I try and do is take some of that and then interject these really fantastical, mythical, otherworldly creatures into this, into these, you know, reference points that are again, very sort of commercial, depopulated, dehumanized. And then there was like these fantastical, otherworldly elements interjected into it. Um, so what do you want to look at? We could take a look at uh, some more images or we could jump into some 3D stuff. What Let's jump into some 3D stuff. So this was going back off of that series of these sort of portraits of these like robotic forms that are uh, not quite human, not quite, we don't know what they are. And so this is the software I use that I construct all my animations in and also construct all of my prints in and that I also use to create my um, 3D printed works as well. Um, so this is a recent work, so that's why I wanted to show it here. I'm just finishing nice. this piece up. It's, it's from a series called uh, Soft Power. Uh, and we could see some of the other, yeah, yeah. We could see some of the other pieces too from the series. Um, so they're like, so they're sort of like regal portraits, like they're sort of these like robotic alien aristocrats. I sort of think of them that they're, uh, you know, they're composed of like soft fabrics and organic um, feeling furniture, but then also there are these technological components and then there are these like, uh, you know, Baroque components and gold and jewelry. Um, so this is a new series called called Soft Power. And I'm still you kind of thinking about what they are and what they mean, but I think it's trying to create this portrait that of the power in the digital age, you know, and what does like power and aristocracy, where do all these things mean in the digital age? So we see, you know, there's a lot of details of like, you know, Amazon logos and Peloton logos. And, um, you know, there's like an iWatch in here, you know? <laughs> and so, right, uh, yeah, it's playing Mariah Carey. Yeah. And so, um, and then there's like, you know, bits of technology. There's things that reference like, you know, video game characters and stuff like that as well. Um, and then, um, you know, soft fabrics again to um, create that sort of luscious aesthetic. So. Yeah, I love this, like, I just this kind of reanimating of all of these different logos and textures, but also that they become their own thing too. They transcend all of those things and then they kind of form their own hierarchies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that to me is, you know, that's one of the things I love about art is just that you can, you can take all of these opposing things and somehow kind of weave them together and then they like they create their own stories and this you know it does remind me of and I cannot remember the name of the artist too that used you know the really kind of maybe like 300 year old um paintings of like different fruit and and yeah, um, Archibaldo. yeah. there thank you <laughs> um so that is another one that um yeah, yeah so you can I'm see some other about. images yeah. in the series yeah it's, I mean, they're really stunning and they, they draw you in just on their own merit compositionally and just, you know, aesthetically. And then you get to those other layers in those pieces. Um, yeah. And let me show you sort yeah. of how a piece like this begins. So I'm looking at like, wow. just like aristocratic portraiture and things like that, you know, uh, to create these works, um, uh, looking at, uh, you know, the way in which, um, like for instance, this piece was like really oh, influential. Fine. Uh, and one of the things that you notice in Rembrandt and uh, you know Hans Holbein and all of these um, you know aristocratic portraiture from Western history is just one of the things I was interested in was like the detail, like the lusciousness of like the jewels and like the fabrics and um, and that was a way to show power, of course, back then, like the quality of you know right. your textiles and your yeah. fabrics and of course the amount of jewelry and all of that. Uh, and so 
and I think there's some very interesting parallels too to like our consumer culture today and like always and tech specifically with technology, you know, we always wearing these new shiny, you know, technological devices and things like that. So I think I'm trying to create some draw some parallels between those elements, you know, this sort of really aristocratic, decadent uh, era of history uh, compared to our digital age today and trying to draw some of those parallels. That's fascinating because we are in the midst of a technological revolution. I mean, we really are. And and something that symbolizes power, especially with these tools, is the ability to make them hyper-realistic is one of the hardest things to do in this software. As we know, who use the software, I mean, that is like, that is so challenging in terms of all of the components, especially when you're using you know, you're doing such complicated things. It's you're not just doing a sphere with a texture on it. Oh wow! Yeah, so it's I love so, stuff like this. Yeah. This is uh, Ancre. You know, this is a portrait yeah. of Napoleon. It hangs in Paris at uh, a military museum there, and you got to see it in person just because you know all yeah. these like, crazy, you know, luscious velvets and all that. So that's what I'm trying to do. You know, in my piece is trying to uh, it's referencing this you know painting, and again, I'm very interested in painting. So this is like a, what a rendering would look like of that of that piece yeah. that we just we just yeah. saw in the uh, uh, here, you know. Yeah, and I like that there's this. I mean, you really want to understand if there's a human underneath there. Mm -hmm. Like you want, like I keep thinking about, like what if there was a little like cheek or like ear sticking out? Is it a human or is it you know right. some sort of robot? I don't know, and that that kind of tension that I'm experiencing, I think it's really interesting. Um, and I like how you're using such decorative aspects, like in this, you know, you're a white man and you're you're playing with these ideas of decorative decoration and your color palette is very much like these pastels, which have been associated, you know, not with a masculinity so much. And so I think that's an interesting juxtaposition too, to kind of repurpose that. Um, and give it a new meaning. That's beautiful. What is this? Uh, this is a the center of a Baroque guitar uh, from Spain oh, okay. uh, throughout the Baroque era and Renaissance era. Um, Spanish guitars were famous for having their, I forget what it's called. It's like the hole in a guitar, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and things over this, right. Yeah. So they would uh, decorate them quite uh, substantially with these, um, with these very Baroque uh, and Gothic designs. So these kinds of things influence me a lot in my work, uh, both in my sculpture and also in this series too, because uh, of like, you know, you have the eyes in this series, um, you know, which are like, you know, these openings and stuff and White, you know, yeah. or like rose windows or like these Gothic, you know, elements into the eyes in this series. So. They almost look like they have kaleidoscopic vision. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, like mm -hmm. or a spider vision or something. I mean, it struck me too thinking about decoration and architecture because you know, obviously, in like the mid twentieth century, there was a huge distrust of decoration, and decoration was seen as superfluous mm -hmm. or maybe feminine or frivolous or you know, um, the entire Le Corbusier and all of that modernist architecture was you know decoration wow. was seen as frivolous. Um, yeah, yeah, superfluous. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what modernism did. It just sort of tried to minimize everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I, 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 a lot of my pieces are very decorative. We see a lot of Baroque architecture and gold ornamentation in the works. And I think I do this largely because we live in, I think, a very decadent society today. But because of these sort of modernist uh, ideas that you just, you know, uh, alluded to, we, we tend to think of this as not decadent, you know, because, you know, we have these simple, you know, simple aesthetics, for instance, but I think it is a very decadent society with our oh, lives yeah. and digital I mean, I technology. Like we're living in like the capital city from the Hunger Games, you know, like. Right. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. And so, so anyways, I think I'm sort of just referencing some of that, bringing in that his, his, our historical references, their references to history and trying to draw some of the parallels to today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think you're you're nailing it with that. I mean, it's but I just love I mean, I'm really I love seeing these reference um, photos like what you're looking at. And I also love, again, how you have all of these ideas, but then there's this like transcendent layer of this new soft power series where the eyes become these portals. 
Mm-hmm. And you're, you, it's kind of like, you know, when you're thinking about the Mona Lisa, one of the, you know, the reasons why it's gotten so famous is just that gaze. Well, you're, mm-hmm. you're playing with the gaze, um, but you're using these like very um, layered kind of portal like eye shapes um, that reference a number of different like uh, decorative themes from different times. And I think that's really powerful, especially, you know, now in our masked time, you know, when we're all having to mask up. I mean, it's interesting to see that this body is just like a collection of brands with like nobody. Yeah. Else. yeah. And that those are the signifiers of identity. And it's, you know, right. right. Like the sheet with the ghost, and there's like nobody under the sheet. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, yeah. I, and, and yeah, my friend uh, Amir H. Fala, he's a painter and he does that with people's, like, he'll take all of their things in their apartment and he'll drape them over them. And then that will be the, um the portrait and he did one of me and I had a disco ball at the time so that was pretty fun but mm-hmm. it's I love that idea of a portrait being of somebody's things and that maximalist um aesthetic but I'm also just there's nothing in here though it's just it's empty it's all hollow uh, <laughs> yeah I know and that's well that's really interesting too in general I've had people who don't use any software ask me like what are your sculptures made out of and I thought that was an interesting question. Like, what are these made out of? It's like, well, it's, you know, first level, you're like, oh, it's a polygonal mesh. And then the next level, it's just information. You know, it's just like, you know, a file. Um, but I, I wonder, I, I want to know a little bit more. I'm getting a little geek out here, but um, a little more about, you know, your tools and your workflow and do you are you are you just using um 3d studio max or are you do you use other programs or like what's your i just use 3d studio max really yeah and then oh. some sometimes i'll work with like various um like sometimes video game modding tools or software that sort of sometimes uh, appropriate ext- uh, extract uh, you know models and textures from like video games and sort of work with them and reinterpret them. Uh, so uh, you know, for instance, something like this. I don't even remember where this was from, Mortal Kombat or something. Just a very generic like robotic sort of torso. You know, so I would sort of take that and collage it in with these pieces of furniture and these pieces of jewelry. You know, to create some of that those forms. You know, mm-hmm. um, so it's a bit of like a, a appropriation aspect in the works too. But a lot of it is also then handmade and handcrafted, right? Uh, in order to get the the feel and the Your look that I'm bashing. going for. Your kid yes, bashing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, I love. Yeah. I I feel like there needs to be an exhibition about kit bashing because I I'm all I love kit bashing and I feel like the art world doesn't understand yeah. what it is at all. And it's such an, an yeah. We need to think about that. We need to marinate on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you're you're getting. Do you use ZBrush at all? Are you? No. Really? Yeah, I'm so I do. I used oh, to nice. use it a little bit. I just. Uh, for instance, for something like this, I, you know, I mean, 3D Studio Max has like freeform tools, you know, so right. we just might, let me collapse this so we can see it, but I might just, uh, you know, go into here and, um, you know, some of this was created using initially like cloth uh, um, cloth simulations, and, yeah. but then, uh, but then I could just kind of go in there and, you know, modify things, you know, as I, as Move I, things I, around. I to fix things. Yeah. Brush tools, yeah. So, yeah especially like down here, like if I wanted to get like the natural form of this like sort of jewelry interacting with this piece, right. I, could, I could go into there with some of these tools. Uh, and they, you know, it it works just as well, I guess, as ZBrush. ZBrush has a few more um, obviously mm-hmm. detailed options and more brushes and more mm-hmm. brushes for deforming surfaces, what but- this, this looks like much better for what you're doing. I was just curious, like if you ever, like if there was an like organic sculpt you ever wanted to make and, use the brush but most of the stuff now that i'm looking it, it would be better in this type of program to make it z brush yeah, would probably make it so. more complicated because yeah. ZBrush, it's like you start with such a big like a high res polygonal mesh and you have to then bring it back down whereas in traditional 3d modeling you start low and build high so it's yeah, like a completely yeah. different mindset for building something especially if you're going to be doing all these textures now, mostly everything I do is, is polygonal modeling. It starts off in um, just with, uh, yeah, with a box, you know, and then uh, oh, yeah. uh, extrude and, and subdivide. Traditional, and, yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, Isn't yeah. it funny now? There's like a tra- there's like a traditional there's a tradition, <laughs> right. you know, like um, because I came in um, 3D modeling in ZBrush first. <laughs> So I have a completely backwards like perspective of 3D modeling for that reason. It was kind of interesting to learn about that um, organic mesh sculpting versus traditional 3D modeling. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, what is this piece? Yeah, well, take a look at some more work here. So we got, uh, so I, when I create these video installations, they take a very long time to make because I'm the only person doing it, you know, and I mean, we can also (laughs) load up like the one I'm working on now, but uh so they take like a year to make and they sort of act as like a nexus for like an interdisciplinary body of work so yeah so we have like here a, a sculpture that is related to that disco beats video we just saw with the starbucks you know so here we have the starbucks logo that i just sort of took inverted it uh cut out some of the elements to it and created this like minimalist sculpture in a way of the starbucks logo and here it's like this fake fur that's sort of coming through uh, the logo elements to create this really sort of large ominous steel um, form. Uh, and so it's like, it's a laser cut steel. And then there's, I put some fake fur behind it. Uh, and then it's sort of mounted on the wall as a sculpture. Mm-hmm. And who do you then, work with to do your laser cutting or do you do it all yourself as well? Uh, well, this one I worked with just a facility close by. Um, okay. I had a CNC uh, steel laser cutter and then I had the steel uh, finished and uh, powder coated. Right. And, uh, and then I just assembled the fur and a little backing behind it. And then this is a 3D printed uh, unicorn. Um, so that unicorn in captivity. So this references that tapestry a little bit more directly also with the proportions of the mm-hmm. base here. And then, uh, so it's, but instead of being in this garden or this nice natural uh, landscape, the unicorn is sort of stuck in this TSA checkpoint, you know, which is like this <laughs> technology. It's like technology, right? That's, but it's also connected to like the surveillance and control and authority. So, uh, so that's what we're seeing here with this work. And so this is uh, 3D printed in gold plated brass. So it's uh, printed in like wax, uh, casted in brass, and then gold plated. Was that with the shapeways for those? Yeah, this was done with shapeways. Yeah. Yeah. And this is also 3D printed ceramic uh, form here. Right, you know? ceramic porcelain, yeah, I've used And that. it references yeah. some of those like Baroque materials too, you know, of like, um, you know, Baroque decoration, the decorative arts and uh, from that time to porcelain and porcelain and gold and all that, you know. Mm. Um, you can talk about NFTs and stuff too, if you want. Yeah, uh, so I don't yeah, know, what yeah, you, let's, what do you uh, want to do? Let's to talk about with you but can we can you show because one of my favorite sculptures that you made was the kind of pillow face out of marble yeah i just would Uh, love to i love for everybody to see that in relationship with all of these conversations and then going back to what you said originally i think this really yeah yeah, is um Ooh, look at your files. <laughs> yeah, this is always our favorite bit. And then we get really nerdy. We love seeing how people file, like organize their files and label their files because there's just, oh, wow. Yeah, you are very organized. Um, sort of, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm actually having trouble finding that thing we're trying to look for here. So. Oh, maybe, well, take I, your maybe time. Maybe I put it in this. But I, I just want to, I wanted to but like anyways, this is that. one of them. I'll show yeah. you this one. Um, so I was taking busts of, um, sorry, I'm just switching in between some different versions and stuff. There's always some issues. Oh, no, that's, but, that's, yeah. Um, but uh, so I was looking at like busts and sometimes I would like, you know, find like 3D scan busts or like, you know, and then I would bust from like, you know, the Baroque time, this, this idea of like a portrait or something of somebody that is, um, um, you know, supposedly this like aristocrat or somebody very important. Mm -hmm. And then creating this sort of like alien version of that where uh, the skin and the face become this synthetic surface, this sort of alien synthetic sort of Chesterfield sofa surface, you know? So you could kind of see some of the the, the details on, you know, how that goes. So beautiful. And there's a new tool in ZBrush right now, which has these, what I can't remember what they're called in upholstery, like an upholstery. um, Yeah. Yeah, you know, button that you can paint on <laughs> to a form, and it just it's like it's so amazing that 
I mean, how did you go about making this and this software? So how was, what was uh, well, this? This was about? created, I don't have the, the history here because this is the flattened version, but this was right. created actually just using like a displacement map and UV. So I would like uh, oh. UV unwrap uh, the face and then using uh, a displacement map would displace that based off the texture. Uh, so maybe, I don't know if we, yeah, you could kind of see the texture here. Oh, oh, cool. Um, so this yeah, is the no, displacement no. map that goes I'm onto the surface. That. Yeah. That's a smart way to go about that. And then it, and, it's very clean. Yeah. yeah. And so what yeah, this would do is, uh, well, it was also nice too, because it's not just like a surface decoration. It's actually really deforming the mesh a lot, you know, yes, yes. Um, because it's really it creating a lot of depth it, into the works. Interesting. Um, there are, so there is some really interesting software out there and I'm blanking on the name, but like through the Lady Tech Guild meetup, I know I've met a couple of people who are working for some of these new software companies that are doing clothing simulation. Um, and some of what they can do is just out of this world. Some of the like, um, clothing so the, yeah. Can yeah. you, can you show us the wireframe on this? I'm just curious to see that. Yeah. Well, because this is creative for like, um, uh, it's really detailed because this was created for 3D printing. And so I think what happened was uh, in this version, I, there was like, um, you know, optimization things that went over on top of the mesh just to seal everything off because this is like a solid STL right now. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. so when, so to create, you know, that solid STL form, there's usually like, there's just various retopology uh, tools and stuff that I do on the surfaces just to clean everything up and, you know, and make sure that, yeah. you know no manifolds or whatever yeah. so um you could do the edge so this is just a very kind of like a hollowing and the drain holes and all that stuff yeah 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 so this is a very kind of i forget what they call this as like a name for these types of triangles um whatever it is you know so i just know them as tries yeah <laughs> Yeah. Re, re-topologizing. Yeah. Yeah, that's, retopologize. I don't know. It's like yeah. called like a Veroni or a, a oh. I don't know. Whatever oh, it's called. I don't know. That it uses to do the retopo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, some sort of programmer figured out how to do it and that's named after him. Do you um, do that in 3D Max as well? Like you get it yeah. ready for yeah, there's like different pro optimization uh, yeah. things you can do onto here because again, with like a 3D printing or like a ah. CNC milling thing. You know they have like file size limits and uh, you know if the surface is too detailed there's too many polygons on the surface it's going to just either crash the um yeah, the processing yeah yeah so what is um, the size of this one well it's, it could be anything right now um i'm okay. actually i've done some i don't know if they're in my talk here no, oh i'm no, sorry no. what's the poly count Oh, I don't know if you could find out. We yeah. Have to go into thing. It's a lot. Yeah. But yeah, okay. you could calculate, okay. for instance, which is with this pro optimizer on 3D Max, you, know, you can uh, lower the vertex by a certain percentage, you know, so it'll okay. process okay. it. Yep. Wow. And then you can pop in. So if you want like half the polygons into it, you can top, pop that in. And then there's different options too for preserving, you know, the types of detail and stuff like that. Awesome. Okay. Oh, so, yeah. It's nice. Oh, that's reasonable. So you could turn this down to like 10%, you know, because originally this was much higher, you know, so yeah. you turn this down 10% right. and see how the, you know, the surface gets simpler, you know. Yeah. Oh, thank you. This is making my day. I should go back to Max. <laughs> That's what I started. And then I got hired to teach Maya. So I had to learn Maya in like three weeks. And then I've like. No, we're, I'm, I'm jumping in Blender. That's my, yeah. that's my new. Go back Blender. To Blender and Substance. Yeah. <laughs> but I have done, uh, let's see, I'll go to my website. Here. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have done um, marble versions of that piece. And this is what I've been mm -hmm. trying to work on with that series is um, trying to create marble versions of those types of works. Mm -hmm. And so I did one process with this, uh, this one. And so I made a few marble pieces, you know, using Beautiful. the surface, using this aesthetic. Uh, so these were uh, carved in um, Italy, um, in the yeah. mountains of Italy, where the marble is sourced from, I was, which is like this marble carving town, traditional marble carving towns that go back hundreds of years, you know. And so this technology sort of reinvigorated this sort of marble carving uh, economy in these small towns in, mm -hmm. in Italy and uh, a lot of these places where marble, car you know, marble carving, obviously, in the, you know, 
1800s, you know, early 1900s used to be a much bigger industry than it is now. It was more of a decoration, common decoration, buildings and construction. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these um, economies that were built around marble carving, a lot of the craftsmanship that goes back hundreds of years was sort of being lost, but now technology has sort of reinvigorated that. So I went there and uh, lived in this town for a month and we carved a sculpture using the robots and then we mm. i did some hand finishing on the piece to, how hard was it to yeah. do the hand finishing how like was it just chisels and dremels like what are we talking like is it just uh, sanding it, 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 it's like pneumatic yeah it's like pneumatic uh rotary sanders mostly you know what is a pneumatic uh, rotary sander i mean i know what just a rotary sander is well yeah it's like um well, it's just a rotary sand. It's just, it uses air instead of power, you know. So oh, air. I see. And it, it, which gives you, I think, a little bit, it's a little bit less dangerous, but it's good for marble carving too, mm. um, I think. And also some hand sanding as well. There was definitely some, you know, this was actually the first piece I ever, this is the first time I ever touched marble. So I got there and the piece was like largely carved by the robot. And then I had to really go in and learn what marble was to, f to get the right finish. Uh, so it was an interesting process, but uh, I learned a lot from it and it was really successful. So I made a few pieces like this and I'm trying to make some more, you know. Yeah. How did, that, how did you like that, like kind of jumping into that other medium? Because, you know, you have such a mastery over your tools. Like how, how did you feel about jumping into a, something where it's like, oh, I need to learn this right now? Well, going back to you know, my bio, I, you know, studied computer graphics for my undergraduate degree. And then I sort of began making artwork. I began using my expertise in computer graphics and animation to create video installations. And I also began exploring 3D printing and stuff back then. But so I became really committed to try and create an art practice, a contemporary art practice, you know, and I really wanted to explore the creating physical work too. I just wasn't yeah. happy just creating work in the virtual computer screen. I wanted to get things out there in terms of video right. installations, but also in sculpture. And so I didn't really have any skills or knowledge of that. And so it was always this learning process. And I went to my MFA, my graduate school and it was a program that was a lot more sculpture focused and it was a you know studio art program at University of Maryland and so that was intentional because I really wanted to explore and learn a lot more about sculpture and I'm still learning I'm still struggling uh, but um, but I've always been trying to you know get my work you know outside of you know like here's just an, one example like we showed before always trying to you know expand my work outside of the computer into these uh, sculptural forms <clears throat> So That's, it's always a learning process. Yeah, right. Like I feel like I was two years ago. I remember I had a com I can might even have been with you, Colette, where I had a conversation <laughs> where I was like, I am just not even going to call myself a digital artist anymore. And I just want to show my work in sculpture galleries. And you know, and then you know, everything happened. Um, <clears throat> and so now people are more likely to seeing work on a screen. And hopefully, you know, the art world's reopening and that's changing. Um, but yeah, like maybe that would be a good segue into the NFTs to talk about how mm -hmm. you're presenting work on the screen and selling, you know, digital assets. That yeah, well, that's a good, that's a good segue too, because yeah, I mean, for so long, I've been trying to figure out ways to bring, you know, my practice into the physical space and to yeah. give people physical experience for my work, which I always felt was very important. Yeah. And it's, it's been a struggle uh, and I've learned a lot and it's been frustrating, but it's, it's this challenge that I keep trying to challenge myself to. Uh, but then of course, once these sort of lockdowns happens and social distancing and all of this, it's, yeah, it's just people haven't been experiencing artwork like they used to anymore. And so, you know, I had many shows canceled and many shows postponed. Yeah. And like a lot of people too, and not just in visual arts too, you know, fashion, sports, music. Um, you know, yeah. So there's been all this like potential energy that was, I think, built up during, you know, the lockdowns. Mm -hmm. And so I, it was so weird, like a, a year ago in September of 2020, I got within one week, I got like three emails from like three different people uh, asking me to make NFTs. And okay, so that I had was a Google early on the uh, NFT event. That was really early. Yeah. So, so about a year ago, 
exactly for like right now, back in like September of 2020, I got contacted by several different people asking me to create NFTs. And I had to Google what an NFT was. Um, they were all developing these platforms and they wanted digital artwork to be minted as NFTs. Mm. And so I looked up what an NFT was and I said, okay, I, I sort of did that in the past. And um, back in 2013, I experimented with using uh, the Bitcoin blockchain to authenticate digital artwork. Um, really? As a digital art. Yeah, you know, I mean, as, as artists that work with technology i mean you know my my videos only exist as like a video file right yeah. and it's something that can be sort of copy and pasted it's something that it doesn't feel like it's particularly authentic you know uh, as a painting would or as a you know or something so so i experimented with you know ha having these bitcoin transactions um serve as authentication tool for uh, for artwork and for my digital artwork. And I was working with a few people that were sort of developing this stuff. It was very early on in this uh, process. This was like 2013 or so. Uh, so you could kind of see uh, the result here. So, you know, when I create my video installations, we addition them and collectors and museums acquire them. And this is what they get. They get uh, a case like this with a USB drive on it. Sometimes they're different than this. Um, but back then I did this where they were also getting a, you know, cryptographic hash that authenticated their, um, that addition. And so uh, this was sort of a, a proto NFT. What had happened in the year since then was this uh, concept. Other artists were also exploring this concept. Other uh, companies were exploring this. And I guess eventually this morphed into something a lot more streamlined, which is an NFT, which is a digital asset token, um, uh, a specific digital asset that exists on, in this case, the Ethereum blockchain. And so, uh, you know, Back in, I guess, early around 2017, 2018, 2019, people were starting to create artworks uh, as NFTs on these uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. And so these platforms started emerging and they started getting, um, they started asking me to be involved in this. And so I created, I eventually went, decided to create some work with uh, Foundation, uh, Lindsay Howard, the curator, uh -huh. yeah. um, reached out to me and uh, I respect the work that Lindsay had done, her curatorial yeah. work. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, let, let's do this. I was very skeptical at first because I had explored this concept, you know, as I mentioned, you know, with this earlier pieces and I would tell people about it. We would talk about it and nobody cared. Like everybody was just like, you know, this is stupid. Like who cares about the blockchain? Like every, you know, that time. yeah. Yeah. A lot of people at that time were, you know, were talking about the blockchain and art and, um, I found it pretty interesting, but I also found about it for a long time, right? Like there had been yeah. these conversations, yeah. But I found that nobody else really cared, you know. Like it was just kind of like uh, you guys are like computer geeks, like get out of here, like you know, nobody is going to care. Blockchain and art is never going to work, you know. And so when I mean, that's the, like a lot of technology and tools, even three D printing, like all of those things. People were like, nobody cares. Like, why are yeah. you doing this? That's that's so much. So many curators, especially in school or especially shortly out of school. I remember 04, 05, you know, I'd be doing artist talks and people would say, I'd have curators at the institution be like, yeah, don't talk about how you made it. Like it's boring. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. I have yeah. people telling me that still. <laughs> yes, exactly. So and so, that's interesting right there. That is an interesting so, phenomenon. So anyways, a year ago, I was really skeptical, but like I said, I, you know, I respected the work of Lindsay and, and stuff. So I created some works for this foundation uh, app, uh, foundation.app or this foundation platform, NFT platform and minted my first NFT. Um, and then there was several changes with how things happened. And, but it wasn't until like January in, in, which is until this thing started to pick up some steam, this whole NFT craze and phenomenon. And so uh, then my, you know, these NFTs sold on foundation and uh, there started to be all this craze and all this hype. Yeah. And of course you had that big news about Christie's and all that stuff was going on. Um, and so I think I actually, at one point I had, um, 
I had like a news crew in my apartment, like interviewing me about oh, NFTs. Wow. She's like That's the awesome. Korean broadcasting system. So I was like on the news in South Korea, like a million people in South Korea were watching me That's talk about so NFTs. Um, there was like all these new, there was just so much going on. You know, uh, this was like March of April in April yeah. uh, back then. Uh, I also, there's this really interesting confluence too with NFTs about um, musicians and fashion and all of this stuff was going on too. Um, I also, I always like to, when I talk about NFTs too, there's, you know, there's a lot you can say about them. One of the promises of NFTs too was always the way in which it can take artists um, and be a, a maybe a more democratic way for artists to support themselves, you know, sort of outside of some of the traditional art world systems. You don't have that interest and, like that with them. Yeah. I know tons of artists who are very successful in, in NFTs and we've had conversations and they're like, well, I got an offer to art school, but I postponed it. And I was like, that is a great business decision because you're just getting, you know, they were like, should I spend $50,000 a year to go to art school? And I was like, wait find a state school you know don't put yourself in massive debt if your career yeah. is going well just for this year anyway um, yeah. so it's a whole other question but yeah it's, it, there's, I think there's a lot of people in that space too who have said you know that their parents would never support them going to art school that they mm -hmm. want to and they grew up in families that didn't have the resources um, right. you know so it is really interesting yeah. And I think just, I always put the slide in it too, like one of the, some of the most successful NFT artists or NFT artists, so to speak, are, you know, are, are like, are women and people of color and people that might not have, um, that, that you might not think were really successful in this space have been tremendously successful in this space. So, yeah. so it's been great to see the, these voices elevated. Uh, but another interesting confluence too about NFTs was this, you know, connections between sports and music and fashion and so I did this uh, collaboration with like a viral TikTok star and I created some visuals for yeah. um, uh, for uh, this uh, performer, Nathan Evans, this musician, um, and he got very famous also because of the lockdown. Again, I think the lockdown and the pandemic and this NFTs, I, I think they're very closely connected for a lot of reasons. Perhaps it's like because of inflation and, and this um, you know, disruptions in society, but also because there's just all this like built up energy, this like potential creative energy that's been yeah. built up because you know yeah. musicians haven't been able to perform, you haven't been able to go to concerts or art shows or art openings or fashion shows or whatever. And so there's just all this energy that was built up, I think. Yeah. Um, it just exploded into this NFT space. It's just sort of this osmosis or whatever you call it into this, um, you know. Have you ever, are you now, like that original piece, the mothership, piece, um, which I, I'm really glad you shared that because that is yeah. so interesting that you were thinking about that and that you actually did that before this, you know, this particular trend. And there's not a lot of people who can, who can say that. Is this, did this piece sell? And, or if it didn't, would you mint it as an NFT now? Um, because yeah. <laughs> a few, yeah, a few of the editions have been acquired, yeah, um, okay. by, by collectors um, back, you know, back in the day. Um, yeah, I, I, for me, I don't like to maybe go back and like mint Re old works as right. NFTs. Um, for me, like also because a lot of times some of the editions have been sold, you know, so it's weird right. when you have an edition Money that's, orders. yeah. yeah it specifies that the edition is this, that it has a certificate of authenticity. Right, also, these all come with certificates yeah. of authenticity too. Right. So going back and adding NFTs, it's a little, I, right. I can't wrap my head around that. Um, other artists do, maybe it's fine. works. I guess meant like just reintroducing it in the same way you did it, like it could be on the block, you know, on the Bitcoin blockchain, Yeah. Um, but just reintroducing it into this new audience, this new understanding and appreciation of it, but as like kind of something like an artifact it's literally an artifact of yeah, your yeah, yeah. your practice but also of the kind of information that led to creating an nft in the first place so i think it's just an interesting um kind of tie back um into what you're doing now into how you've been thinking as an artist all along. I mean, you're very much an early adopter. You were an early adopter with all the tools and with the mindset um, of, you know, the metaverse and all of these things. Like, so I think that's, I think that's really interesting, but also now with your phys, and I, and I also want to go back to what you were saying about being 
really interested in bringing works into the physical. This is something I think about a lot when I'm, I'm digitally sculpting is like, you know, oh, I want to get this out of the screen and into the space. And that's what's so interesting now about NFTs, because I do think there's a physicality to NFTs that's a little different than just, you know, scrolling through Instagram or, you know, all of these things. I think there's people are feeling this physicality when they feel like they have a line on the blockchain that they own. There's something about that that is very um, visceral to people. I don't know if it's just our natural capitalist kind of wanting to own parts of things or if it's like feeling so overwhelmed by this world, this um, technological revolution that we're in the midst of where we have digital lives, which we were talking a little bit about before we started recording, you know, that we have social media presence, we have physical presence, and especially during the pandemic, that digital presence and that social media presence kind of, kind of hit a level of, you know, where it was exceeding our physical presence with people. Um, So, you know, some people's screen time, like in the past year and a half, the stats that like phone companies are collecting on how much time people are on their devices I think I read something like that it's like seven, seven and a half hours a day Mm. that people, you know, with full-time jobs, they're literally on their phones the rest of the time. And like also a fair amount of time at work, I think you'd have to be like kind of the amount of time that we're in front of these devices, you know, anyway. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I think there's what's happening is this NFTs became also this first time with people, began to gain, I think, a new understanding of like digital content, digital assets is something that, yeah, you could own and that can be- um, It could be uh, limited in its availability. Yeah, yeah. limited in its availability and, and owned and, and possessed. And, uh, and, and that's really interesting too. Yeah, it's like this bridge between like, like you said, the physical, it's really interesting thinking about these as like a physical thing because it's something that you own. And when we talk about digital information, it's always the stuff that's uh, out in the ether, right? That's just, it's, you know, these digital files and these digital images are just sort of exist in the web. But now with NFTs, they still do that, but there's this element of ownership brought in. And yeah, I think that's absolutely connected with the more time we spend on screens and in, the, yeah. and in these virtual yeah. spaces, you know, so. And wanting to own and have control over part of it, like having, you know, a piece of yeah. the pie, so to speak. Yeah. And I think that connect, well, I mean, that's something Sophie and I are really interested in. And that's what we, you know, our most recent exhibition, like bridging that physical and digital, because there still feels so much like this dissonance between, you know, the training in the traditional art world and academia and this current um, NFT world um, and this NFT community, which um, I'm I'm a little bit newer. I'm probably, I'm the newest here to it. And one thing I've heard, and I'm wondering if you do this, um, is do you ever, with your current sculptures, your current physical sculptures, are you going to start minting NFTs um, with them and with your, or with your, um, uh, your prints as well? Well, that's a great question. This piece, uh, I'm going to work on exactly doing that. I'm working with Mm -hmm. uh, um, a company out uh, from based out of Switzerland, and they have a concept of NFT plus and they have a whole system worked out and they've had a lot, of, this company too has a lot of experience uh, authenticating like blue chip artworks and paintings and uh, things like that. They, they come from that uh, it's not space. Is it? No, it's not monograph. It's yeah. something else. I don't know if I should say it. Yeah, I don't know if they're yeah, no, you know, not fine. No. But they, um, so they are working with like this idea of NFT plus and we'll see, I think it's really interesting. So, you know, you have like an NFT um, and then you, that is connected to a physical object, like a 3D printed sculpture, for instance. So we're doing that with this. So I'm going to create a nice animation with this and then also, uh, print this sculpture out and that will be, and it comes as like one package, you know? So, um, so it's like a, a more integral way of like authenticating, um, yeah, physical, physical right. artwork. Like your mothership piece. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's just so, I'm just still so fascinated. I did not know that you had done that in 2013, you said? Um, yeah, uh, I was in uh, a residency in Berlin and I met this curator 
And the security was just like, oh, let's go have dinner with my husband. He's interested in like tech and the blockchain. Maybe you, you could have some stuff to talk about. And so he was pitching me on this idea. He had this vision of like essentially what NFTs are. And it was just like, you know, we can use the blockchain to have this whole, um, you know, wasn't called the metaverse back then, but like this whole metaverse in the way in which we, you know, authenticate things and authenticate digital artwork. And, um, you know, so anyways, it was a really interesting uh dinner conversation and then when NFTs exploded I was just thinking back to that oh, like, man sure. I was just like way ahead of the time you know so yeah so that's okay so now I'm wondering how do you feel about how do you navigate as just an artist and a human like you know dealing with the amount of social engagement we have to do as artists in both the physical spaces, a little less so now because of the pandemic, but still, I mean, fairs are back, galleries are open, mm -hmm. we may have to wear masks, but our job is to be out there and connecting. And then now with NFTs, and for those of you who don't know out there, Twitter is basically the home of NFT, of the NFT community in, in addition to other platforms like Discord. Um, and so it brings like, cause Instagram has pretty much been the powerhouse for the traditional art world in terms of posting and interacting, but now Twitter is the, you know, so what, yeah, how are you navigating that? Well, I, you know, being an artist is very hard, but one of the most rewarding <laughs> aspects of being an artist for me is like when you, like you're in like a gallery or museum and you're seeing people experience your work and you're seeing right. them like, you know, involve themselves in the work and having reactions to the work and having feelings about the work. You know, that's something that's really great. And that's what makes being an artist worth all the hard work and, and, and problems and issues is, is really seeing um, people have a meaningful experience with what yeah. you created for them. And, and so I, I love that aspect of being an artist and going to even 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 in art fairs, but mostly you know at, at openings and, and and gallery shows and seeing people really engage with the work, uh, and so it's definitely a little, you get a little bit less of that I think in the NFT space because it's it's oftentimes more about hype and um, and about price uh, and about you know, what's hot right now, then it is about the quality of the work or the meaning yeah. of the work, you know, so yeah. it's a little tricky. I've struggled too to try and figure out how to use this NFT format to create things that are sort of interesting and meaningful, you know, so it's been a struggle to figure that out. Like I did this short narrative that's similar to my video installations uh, and I released it in three parts, you know, as NFTs. So this is um, a narrative that I, constructed and it's a character that I created this sort of mythical panther that's covered in these app icons and these that's based off of this historical myth of this multicolored panther that we see from ancient mythologies and yeah. so anyway so I reinterpreted this myth as a as a modern day um, modern day story here at least as three NFT parts, you know, so, um, so anyways, I'm, we're trying to figure out ways to like, you know, work with the space and create something, uh, you know, that people can engage with and that's strong and that stands on its own and has a strong narrative associated with it. Um, so it's interesting because again, it's just sort of these tiny little squares, you know, that's in a, a database of a million other uh, excellent, uh, visually exciting artworks, you know, so how do you, how do you create something in there that's meaningful? That's a bit of a challenge that we're still Yeah, thinking. I think that's a, that's a great, um, way to look at it. I mean, I think that's um, coming from an artist's perspective too, just like it, I mean, it's, it's hard, it's really hard for me to distinguish. I've been having a lot of conversations with people about the difference between the hype in the art world and the hype in the NFT world, because it's similar. It's based on, you know, what's trending, what's, you know, what are the most expensive things. So it has to do with the capitalist ideals around it, even though the NFT community is, is definitely more about community and more about sharing and resources. It still has the layer of capitalism because it's being, you know, it's priced. And so, yeah, but like how I think the, you know, the filtering through this world is going to be what's interesting to see as time goes by and how artists use NFTs as another way to provide some agency for them in their practices and financially as that has not traditionally been very present in um, artist careers. But
thank you so much for just taking the time to, you know, really dig into your practice with us and like share all aspects of the files that you're using. I think that you are really a great example of somebody who really does that the computer and these tools are really just this conduit for you to like explore all of these different iterations and ideas and concepts, and then to put them out into the world and connect with other people with those ideas. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. No, that's well said. They're so grateful.